Okay. Good evening to all. Uh, and uh, uh, day after tomorrow, you're going to give your exams. Today, we are going to have a quick revision at forensic medicine. Okay, so I'll be slightly faster. And if I'm very fast, then uh, do put it on the chat message uh, that I need to slow down. And uh, it's 4.31, 32. So we can start the session uh, now. Uh, I have been told that these questions have been attended by you in the morning. So now it should be a, just a recall session for you. We will try to add in and incorporate what are the questions that can come also day after tomorrow. Okay? And uh, yes, if you're uh, seeing some questions or some part of it which are new, don't panic. The main aim of the session is for you to revise, okay? And if something that's there, it's okay. Just perceive it. Just don't get, you know, afraid or anything. All the things that I'm going to tell have already been taught to you. So if you just remember something new, don't worry about it. It's okay to add in something new, okay? Okay, so we'll start now. Uh, questions which are yes or no questions. So these yes or no questions are known as leading questions, right? The yes or no questions are known as leading questions and they are asked in the cross-examination okay so they are asked in the cross-examination so recording of evidence yes we are going to get a summon right summon or a subpoena subpoena or a summon is the document that tells me that i have to be in the court at this particular time and this particular date when i get on the same day higher court and lower court i go to the higher court if i get same courts like magistrate courts all magistrate courts then what I do, I prefer to go to the court for which the summon I have received before, but I should always integrate the lower court and the other court, right? Summon is the document that I get, okay? Any person, a witness who gets the document has said to be received the summon. Summon is the document, the paper that they come and give when they say like, okay, you have to go to the court. This is dealt in section 61 to 69 CRPC, okay? 61 to 69 CRPC. Easy. Oath is nothing but a promise. Who need not take an oath? A child less than 12 years need not take a oath. Right? Perjury is what? Giving false evidence under oath. Right? So if someone gives a false evidence under oath, they are said to have perjured. They are said to have lied. Right? That is perjury. Right? And who deals with it? IPC. IPC deals with it, which gives the punishment in section 190. Uh, so it defines it in 191 and gives the punishment in 190. Right? Okay. So hostile witness is who? Hostile witness is the person who gives the evidence against their own party. They might be perjuring or they might not be perjuring, but against their own party, they are giving evidence against their own party party okay so i have got a summon i have gone to the court i have taken the oath i will not do perjury i will not give false evidence under oath and now i am going to get in for the examination in chief which is also known as the statement collection right they first take my statement like what i have to say that is done by the same side lawyer, right? The same side lawyer will do it. Okay. And then what happens? Cross examination. In cross examination, they will ask the leading question. So they will ask leading question. Leading question is yes or no type of question. And who will ask it? It will be asked by the opposite party. Okay. Then comes the Re-examination. Re-examination is again, see, some in cross-examination, they have said yes or no, yes or they, they have asked and they have deviated me, 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 me. In re-examination, the same side party will just clarify the points. They will ask like, okay, doctor, would you like to clarify this particular point? Would you like to clarify that particular point? So that is said in the re-examination. And the court can cast question at any time at any point, okay? Any time during the... Uh, session, they can ask a question. Okay? Yes. And conduct money in civil cases. Okay? The same side lawyer, the lawyer who calls me, gives me money and that is called as the conduct money. The burden of proof. If someone says that like, you know, uh, 
I or any person as X says that Y has done an offense. It is the responsibility of the X to prove that there is some offense has happened. Okay, so it is always on the person who claims it that there is an offense. So if the patient says that, like, you know, the doctor is negligent, the patient has to prove that the doctor is negligent. Right? So that is burden of proof. Very rarely it shifts to the other doc, other side, right? Like for doctors, in case of recipes are locator. Right, let's say a locator is uh, where fact speaks for itself. Wrong limb surgery, gossip is left inside. Press it's a locator. The fact speaks for itself. Okay, now the standard of proof. The standard of proof is the how good should be the proof should be there. Okay, it should be more than 90 percentage or indeed they claim more than 95 percentage for criminal cases. Okay. And in your exams, you can be even given it as 99%. So it has to be absolutely certain to punish a person. Okay. Whereas it's more than 50% in case of civil cases. So civil cases, even if there is more than 50% proof, they will go for a verdict. Okay. Next question. A kills B with the knife, and on investigation, it is found. It was found that uh, just prior to the event, Z has seen A with a knife in a park. Okay, so A kills B just before some time. Z has seen A with a knife beside the sign of crime. Now Z says this in the court, and this is considered as what? It is considered as an indirect evidence. So what is the direct evidence? Direct evidence is directly seen. Okay, if A kills B and Z sees that, that is direct evidence. Okay, and indirect evidence is what? He has not seen the killing, but he's seeing a person with a knife. That's indirect evidence. Hostile witness are people who give evidence against their own party. Okay, so against their own party. Okay, so they give a witness against their own party. So experts are people who have the skill and knowledge to interpret facts. So who are they? They have the skill and knowledge. Okay. So you and I will be experts in court. Okay. We will be called in as experts. We can also be called in as a lay, common, a common witness, but we will be predominantly called as expert witness. Common witness means, let's say I'm going in the car. I see an accident. They call me to the court. I am called as a common witness. Uh, a case of road traffic accident is brought to me for autopsy. Okay. And during the autopsy, uh, I find evidences that uh, the person has been run over because the tire mark and everything is there. Now, when I go and tell this in the court, that becomes a expert opinion. Okay. Okay. So, a brush through in the common legal procedures questions, what comes? Inquest. We have police inquest. We have magistrate inquest. Police inquest comes in section 174. 174 CR PC. Magistrate inquest comes under 176 CR PC. And we have two types of magistrate. We have judicial, okay? And we have executive. Okay? And in this judicial, they deal with death, disappearance, and rape in custody. In custody. Okay? Okay, executive magistrate mainly deal with exhumation, that is removing a person who has been buried, exhumation and dowry death. Okay. Okay. Now you have coroner's inquest and you also have medical examiner systems. Okay, so in coroner inquest, these are not there in India, not there in India. In coroner's inquest, a police uh, or legal official becomes the investigating officer. Medical examiner is nothing but a forensic expert, right? He becomes the investigating authority. Okay. Inquest is nothing but an investigation. It is nothing but an investigation into the cause of death. Okay. Okay. So witness who is a person who is having a first-hand knowledge about the case. So witness is who? The person who has a first-hand knowledge about the case. Okay, you have a common witness when they see things directly. 
right? They saw something. Or while I'm taking the class, you hear a sound of glass shattering. These are all like what we hear, what we see. We are just going and telling fact, right? That's common witness. Expert witness, like if, let's say like there is a person who can tell the pitch of the sound or the uh, chord of the sound, they become an expert witness, right? Okay. Exception to oral testimony, who need not come to the court, like forensic science laboratory people, right? Who gives who give report, right? People who give signed report from an automated machine, they need not come. Any mint officials, mint officials are those who work in money, you know, making process in the country, they need not go for oral testimony. But the court can still, in case if they have a doubt, they still can say, like, no, 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 you come back. Okay, so that is witnesses. Evidences, evidences can be either oral or documentary, and these evidences can also be a direct or a indirect. Direct is you have directly seen it. That is direct. Indirect is I have not seen the murder, I have just heard a screaming sound, right? Or I have not seen the murder, I just saw a person washing a cloth blood stained. I have not seen the murder, I saw a person running with a knife. They are all indirect evidences. Okay. Oral evidences are evidences which are like given by mouth. We go to the court, we tell it by mouth, we become giving out oral evidences. Documentary evidences, I give death certificate, report, uh, injury report, uh, wound certificate or the age report. All of this becomes documentary evidence. And the most important that we kept seeing was dying declaration when the person is about to die. Okay. And he gives a statement about regarding his cause of death. He gives a statement regarding his cause of death. That is called as a dying declaration. Yes? Okay. And uh, for dying deposition, this is again done in outside India, not in India. Okay? And in foreign country, what do they do? They bring the court to hospital. So in the hospital, they will bring the lawyers, the defense lawyer, everyone will come to the court, they will take a oath, they will ask questions with each other. Okay, so that is dying deposition. Chain of custody is from the time that the evidence is collected to the time it is deposited in the court. So from the time it is collected to the time it is produced in the court, right? Who has it, what has it, like who has opened it, the documentation of it is known as the chain of custody. So if the chain of custody is broken, the evidence becomes invalid. In court, right? The police has collected an evidence from the, let's say they collected a knife from the uh, crime scene. They go to the FSL and then they show this knife and uh, they take the fingerprint from it, right? Then they bring it to a uh, biological lab and in the biological lab, they collect the blood sample from the knife. Then they bring it to me and I match whether the wound belongs, can be produced by the knife or not, right? And then it is produced to the court. Now, this is all documented. Who opened it, who did what and everything. If the documentation is not made, then the chain of custody is said to have broken, right? In between, someone could have just opened it, crossed the weapon and everything. Destruction of evidence is not collecting or negligently treating an evidence. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Next topic, medical jurisprudence. Okay. Consent is considered legally valid in which of the following conditions? Legally valid. Right? They are asking when will you consider a consent as legally valid. Okay. 17 year old female medical termination of pregnancy. MTP ages 18 years. Right? Consent for blood sampling under the influence of alcohol. No, he does not understand for what he is giving consent. Relative of recently disease consenting for organ donation. Yes. Okay. So for organ donation alone, after death, it does not matter what the disease has said. It's the relatives say that makes the whole thing. If the disease has said, I don't want my organs to be removed, then no one can remove it. Okay. But if he had said like, yes, I want the organs to be removed, I want to be an organ donor, or if he has not said anything about it, it falls on the relatives. 
Okay, the relatives will decide. Okay, a married female opting for sterilization without her husband. See, sterilization is a permanent process. It's considered as a permanent process. No, though now they are reversing everything. It is still considered as a permanent process. So sterilization without husband consent is considered to be illegal, uh, in unethical actually. It's more considered to be an unethical act along as per the uh, MCI because in 2002 they gave it. Okay, so in 2002 the MCI guidelines gave it and we still have it. Though NMC has come, they have still kept the same rules. Okay, uh, so you have consent. Just let's know the words in consent. There's implied consent, which means Patient comes to the doctor, tells abdominal pain. The doctor says, like, go and lie down. And then he goes and examines the abdomen. That is implied consent. He goes and touches the abdomen. means implied, right? He tells, go and lie down, lift your shirt. Abdomen he's going to examine because he has complained of abdominal pain. That's implied consent. Like, you go to the doctor and someone says, like, breathlessness. And you put the stethoscope on the patient, right? That's an implied consent that the patient has to Express just whether they say it orally. Okay, I'm going to put the you know, stethoscope on your chest. That's an expressed consent. Another form of expressed consent is written consent that we get for surgeries and everything, right? Okay, now other blanket consent. Blanket consent means the moment he comes to the hospital, okay? The moment he enters the hospital, the consent is what for everything. You might fall down. We might have to do dialysis. We might use, we use the ventilator. We might have to do this. Everything that is considered invalid. No. The con consent should be a continuous balance. Loco parent is just when the parents are not there in emergency condition, teachers or principals can act as a guardian. Right? So that is called as loco parent. Okay. Next comes informed consent. Informed consent needs to be, when do you call a consent as informed consent? When you have all these C's written, right? It should be complete consent. You tell the risk, benefits, alternatives, right? Finance, how much it's going to cost. So that's a complete consent. It needs to be comprehensible, which means the person should be able to understand, right? It should be taken from a competent person, which means he should not be under the influence of alcohol. He should not be less than 18 years of age, he should not be mentally unsound or ill. It should be free of coercion. Coercion means threat. Okay, it should be free of threat and it should be a written consent. Okay, now let's see this. Age less than 12 cannot give consent parents or guardian, right? Parents or guardian. Okay, next one. 12 to 18, local examination, only examination. Okay, self, anything more than that, guardian. Okay, more than 18 years of age, self. Slightly disoriented, disoriented means disoriented. That's all, there's nothing as slightly or more or anything like that, guardian. Okay, psychiatric patient currently of sound mind. Current, now he is fine, take it from self. Okay, next. MTP, medical termination of pregnancy. Until it, it's always the mother, until and unless she is less than 18 or insane. Okay, so except in these conditions. For sterilization, couple both. Spouse also has to give the consent. Okay, organ donation from cadaver. If the diseased has said no, if the diseased, which means the person who has died, has said no, then no donation, okay, which implies there is no. If he has said yes, okay, or said nothing, which means he has not commented upon it all, it's the relatives who decide, okay? Okay. Accused of sexual assault or murder. Accused of sexual assault or murder. Okay. It has to be self. If he is not agreeing to examination, arrest and then do examination. I mean, you cannot arrest. Ask the police to arrest the person and then do examination. Okay. Survivor of sexual offense, self. 
If she says no, you get an informed refusal. That's all. If a survivor of sexual offense says that no, I don't want to be examined, you cannot force her to be examined. Medical legal autopsy, police or the magistrate. Okay. Hospital autopsy, always the relatives. Hospital autopsies are those that you do for pathological purpose, right? To understand the pathology of it, you do the uh, autopsy. Okay. Conversion of laparoscopy to conventional surgery in a life-threatening emergency. It's an emergency. You are protected. Go ahead. Okay. The doctor can go ahead. Can go ahead. Okay. If it is not an emergency, wait from anesthesia. Okay. Okay, amputation in an unconscious and unaccompanied, unaccompanied patient. It should be some guardian. Okay, do not resuscitate. It should be properly applied, right? The relatives can take a decision. But it should be properly applied through and it has to be sure that the person is having some terminal illness or something. Okay, okay. History of recent surgery presented with abdominal, uh, abdominal pain and fever radiography shows this particular finding, right? A scissors inside the abdomen of a patient. What do you do? It is recipsa locator. Recipsa locator means pack speaks for itself. Okay, it's a pack. In, there's a wrong limb surgery or a thing that's kept inside. It's a pack speaking for itself. Right? It is a fact treatment for irritant. Okay, we'll see all these rest of these terms down. Okay. Defense against medical negligence. Someone is filing a case of medical negligence. Like these are the words that you now have to remember for the exam. Just let's revise through it. Rest, it's a locutor. Fact speaks for itself. Next, law of limitation, time duration, which means in COPRA, Consumer Protection Act. Okay, it is only till two years. After two years, if the patient comes to know that, like, okay, there's some negligence, he can wait till two years to file the case. But after two years, he cannot file the case. Okay. Next, res judicata or double geopardy. Res judicata or double geopardy means a person who is tried once, okay, cannot be tried again. Okay. Cannot be tried again. If he's tried once, he cannot be tried again. Okay, and punishment has been given, court going on, it cannot be tried again. That is rest judicata. Okay, another difference that you can say is no duty. I was not taking the patient. It was not my duty at all, right? Or I was not there at all. I was in the sleep. So that's all coming under no duties. Next, vicarious liability. Liability means like the person superior takes up the responsibility. Respondent superior. Captain of the ship doctrine. It can be used only in civil cases. Okay. Only in civil cases. Okay. Next. Dereliction of duty. Dereliction of duty means saying that there is no negligence. No, I did not do any negligence. There is no negligence. Okay. So denying negligence is dereliction of duty. Next comes damages. Okay. Next comes damages. Just a minute. Yeah. The current has gone. Okay. Next is damage. Okay. Now damages, you can say that the damage happened because as a result of medical misadventure or a therapeutic misadventure, every procedure has its own risk factor, right? So you can say it happened because of that. So that is medical misadventure. Next is calculated risk doctrine. The patient was told the risk. The risk is associated with a particular procedure. That is calculated risk doctrine. Okay. No. Volunty. Volunty means you have taken the consent. Volunty means you have taken the consent. Okay. Direct causation. Direct causation means uh, negligence happened and because of the negligence only the person suffered. Okay. So that's direct causation. One can deny it by saying there's a novus actus intravenous. Like you referred a patient to the main center. But on the way uh, ambulance came or uh, the ambulance met with an accident. That is 
novus actus intervenus. There is an intervening act that came in between. Now, this next one is, you say, I am not negligence. Patient is negligence. Next, yes, you have tied the splint tightly, but the patient was told to come back to the hospital. He did not come. Okay, so it's the doctor plus the patient. Both are like, you know, responsible. That's contributory negligence. Corporate negligence is a uh, patient fell down on a slippery floor in a hospital. Corporate negligence. Doctors cannot do anything about it, right? A patient wasn't even der uh, derelium, uh, okay? And uh, he jumped out of a hospital building. Patient in psychiatric ward jumped out of a hospital building. The hospital has to ensure that these precautions are taken, right? So that is called as corporate negligence, okay? The burden of proof, this we have already discussed, that it is always on the patient, except in recipsa locator, right? Except in recipsa locator. Okay, now next, age from base occiput. Base occiput is one bone in the skull, which we uh, keep on looking for, mainly when we are saying whether the person's skull is in early adulthood or not. Okay, so if the person is in early adulthood or not, uh, we want to know, we see for the skull. The other skull joints fuse like this. Okay. You don't have to remember all the uh, numbers. Like if you are going to study today, today don't try to crumb in all these things. Just remember it always goes from endo to ecto, which means the fusion happens from inside to outside, right? And it starts somewhere over here in the vertex, right? And then keeps coming, right? So you can see it, it comes... 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. Okay, then 40 to 50, 50 to 60. It goes like this. Yes. Now, again, the rest of the places, it goes from the center itself again. 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 50 to 60, 50 to 70, and then 80. Right. Now, here, right here, where your tedion is there, right, the three bones meet. And this plays again, again, the last bit of fusion, 30 to 40 will happen. Okay. Just remember a basic of it, 20 to 30, it starts over here and progresses forward. It's a memory-based question. Okay. Generally, again, uh, it's less likely to ask specifically, like, you know, tell me 40 to 50 or 20 to 30 or something like that. Okay. Okay. Next, skull ward brought by the police for sex determination. Which is the best bone for sex determination? The bone is the pelvis. Okay, so the pelvis is the best bone, which as per Krogman has an accuracy of 95%. Okay, as per Krogman, it has an accuracy of 95%. Okay. Uh, so what are the features that we look in for female skull? So female skull, I told you, it maintains that of a Infant, child skull itself. So the prominences are big, right? So prominences for the females are big. Both frontal prominence and the parietal prominences are very eminent, right? So the prominences are big. Very good. We agree with it. Okay. We agree with it. The next come mastoid process. Now in males, what happens is it gets pulled by the sternocleidomastoid, right? They have stronger sternocleidomastoid. So it gets pulled, 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 pulled. And it becomes broader and broader and broader and broader and broader. Whereas in females, it maintains a V shape. In females, it maintains a V shape. Okay, so that is the mastoid process. Okay, the next is the glabella. Glabella again here, because of the muscle pull, they have more of a prominence over here. We have a smooth and a small glabella. Okay, the orbital round. No sharp structures, no squares, round, circular. So this we don't have prominent zygomatic arch, right? Males again, because of the muscles, they have that prominence. We don't have, and we have a more of a round forehead. Okay, so we have a more of a round forehead. Okay, yes. So C becomes our answer. So with respect to sex determination, let's revise a few of the questions so that we can go ahead. Okay. So here we have 95 pelvis, right? 
and uh, if you want more than that, either you have skull and pelvis or the whole bone set. So that's the thing that is expected. Okay. A simple table. Ashley's rules have been asked in uh, next exam. So Inisit might ask it. So Ashley's rule is for from the sternum, we come to know whether it is a male or a female. It is also known as the 149 rule. Okay. Okay. Next. The general features, always males have more of the muscle pull. So their prominences are going to be more. Except for the frontal and the parietal prominences. Frontal and the parietal prominences. Okay. And also the preauricular sulcus. Preauricular sulcus is in the pelvis. This is in the pelvis region. And the preauricular sulcus is prominent because the ligament that holds the vitreous goes and gets attached over it. So it becomes more prominent in female. Okay. The rest of the findings, I'll share the document. So don't worry about it. You can but just revise through it. A few of the important points that we will see through is skull we have seen, pelvis. The subpubic angle is more obtuse. Okay, it's more broad because the child has to come out through it. Okay, and all indices are high in female, in pelvis. In pelvis alone, all indices in females will be much, much, much higher. Okay, okay. Then corporobasal, sacral index, kimura index, these are all used for sex determination only. They are all present in sacrum. Only. Okay. Now, if you understand the basis of it, you will uh, try to get it. See, the breadth of the vertebrae body, okay, by the breadth of the whole sacrum. Right? The breadth of the uh, vertebral body by the whole sacrum. Now, see, again, for the females, just because they have to accommodate the child, the wings get spread outside. So the vertebrae will be center small only, but the wings get spread outside. So the spread is more. The whole vertebrae, uh, the breadth of the sacrum is very high now. So automatically they will have a lower value less than 40. Okay. And since their breadth is very high, okay, the anterior posterior uh, length is comparatively small. This is high. The numerator is now high. So this will be high. Sacral index will be high. You see their breadth divided by their length. The breadth is going to be higher. Right? Then the Kimura thing is you take only the wing. Of course, they have a better wing. Females have a better wing. Right? The females have a better wing. Just because their wing is bigger, if you take only the wing divided by the, you know, the vertebrae in center, of course, the females will have more than eight. So I remember it by doubling it in general which means adding 40 each time. See, So when you say corporobasal index, so you're talking only about the base and corporobasal, corporobasal, the basal is the breadth of the sacrum, the, the base of the sacrum, that is the breadth of the sacrum becomes the denominator over here. And since the breadth of the sacrum, which is large, becomes the denominator, this will be the slowest one, which will be 40 in Females less than 40, whereas in males it will go more than 45 and Now, after that comes the Kimura's wing, right? It's Kimura's basal wing. So, when you're going to say basal wing, the wing becomes at the top. So, if you take wing divided by the breadth of the first vertebrae, it is going to be 80. Okay. Then you take the whole breadth of the sacrum, not the wing or the vertebrae, you take the whole breadth of the sacrum. And then divide it by the length of the sacrum, you are going to find it to flow going close near 120 region. Okay, so that's 115. Okay, so I remember it like that. Okay, next, dactylography. Dactylography. Okay, so this we have discussed before also, but now let's revise through it one quick time. Pattern retained by uh, pattern retained by change in distance between ridges. Okay. That pattern of the fingerprint is retained. But the change is the distance in the between the ridges. Where is it seen? Acromegaly. Right. Acromegaly, there's going to be distance between the ridge, which is slightly increased. Okay. Then it complete loss of pattern with ridge atrophy, celiac disease. Right. Complete C for C. Complete losses, celiac 
species. Incomplete rich atrophy. Incomplete rich atrophy it is seen in dermatitis. Okay, so incomplete rich atrophy is seen in dermatitis. Dermatitis cannot remove the uh, skin ridges fully. Only incomplete will be visible. Okay, permanent loss of uh, fingerprint can due to radiation and of course rich alteration can happen in scleroderma. Okay, now remember at least these things pattern. Acromegaly, right? The pattern is retained, but the distance between the ridges are going to get bigger and bigger in case of acromegaly. Complete loss of pattern of the ridges are going to see C for celiac. It is seen in celiac disease. Incomplete ridge atrophy is seen in dermatitis. Okay? Okay. So, when you see it's, uh, dactylography and DNA fingerprinting, your uh, dactylography becomes the most superior one. Okay, it is much more superior than DNA fingerprinting. Sir Francis Galton was the person who first systematized it. It happened in Kolkata. He started using it for when, when people were like having property issue and everything, and when they were not keeping up their words, it started to get a signature in the form of a fingerprint. Okay. Fingerprints are studied by Nowadays, in newer technology, by scanning electron microscopy and also by auto radiography. Okay, so scanning electron microscope and auto radiography loop is the most common pattern. Okay, most of us, if you see our figures, we will have a pattern like this. This is the loop pattern. Most common, sixty-seven percentage is seen, followed by is the world. World is like you know, we say world food, right? Similar to world. So 25 percentage followed by arches, which is 7 percentage. And finally, you have composite, which is a mixture, right? So you have composite, which is 1 percentage. Okay. Next, we come to the permanent loss. We have seen permanent impairment happens in leprosy, right? Okay. We have seen this increase in distance between AIR. Acromegaly, infantile paralysis, rickets, alteration in pattern, any skin condition, right? Alteration in pattern happens in skin condition like scleroderma, eczema, acanthosis nigricans, scleroderma, eczema, and acanthosis nigricans, and followed by atrophy of ridges. Not just alteration, but like atrophy of ridges can happen in celiac disease. If it is complete, C4C. Incomplete is dermatitis, ID. Okay. This was asked last year. 16 to 20 points are important for saying that both matches. Poroscopy is study sweat gland. Okay. Opening pores of the sweat gland opening. If you study, it is called as poroscopy. Podiatry. See, podiatry in zoology would have studied. With the foot of the octopus and everything can be called as podiatry, right? So that is podiatry. Okay, and then chiloscopy means studying the lip print. They have drank water, the lip print they are studying. Palato means the ridges in the hard palate. That is studied. That is called as palatoscopy. So palato means you will understand. Palate means the tongue operation. Celia, celioscopy means lip. Okay, celioscopy means. Podiatry means the limb. And then poro means the pores opening of the sweat gland. Okay. Dentistry, okay. Uh, this again has been asked. So just let's have a quick revision into it. Which of the following is currently matched with respect to the age of eruption in a permanent teeth in human beings, right? Okay. Few of the things that we can remember is our third molar. Our wisdom tooth came after 17 years of age and 17 to 25 when we are studying in college only. It's a college tooth. We gain wisdom in college, right? So it's 17 to 25 is the age for a third molar. So we look for an option where like uh, that matches. Okay. So here you have, uh, we have A and we have C which are matching with that. Then the first molar, the first permanent molar is the first permanent tooth to erupt and it erupts around six years, right? So it erupts around six years. That's another one mark that comes. First permanent tooth to erupt is the first permanent 
molar, right? And it comes at around six years. So here you have another match. Yes. Canine is the last tooth to replace all your temporary tooth. Okay. Canine is the last tooth to replace all your temporary tooth. Because the after your first molar comes, the incisors get replaced, your temporary molars get replaced, then the canine comes in. Right? That's why it's a narrow tooth that comes between the space that's available in a tooth. So that comes at around 11 to 12. That's the age for mixed dentition, right? That's 6 to 12. When you have both permanent and temporary tooth, it is the age for mixed dentition. Okay? okay. The other two marks that can be expected is this. The first temporary tooth that erupts is the central incisor. That we will remember, right? Children and all, they have the central incisor. So the central incisor becomes the first temporary tooth. The first molar becomes the first permanent tooth. Okay. The years, remember that all your temporary tooth will be replaced by the succession tooth. And all your permanent three molars, right? All the three molars will be super adapted. They all find extra space and pump. They don't replace any tooth. Though there are, you know, uh, molars when we are small, the premolars will replace the molars, not the same. Okay, so our temporary permanent molars come at a space behind all the temporary. Okay, mixed dentition we have seen, right? It's the age where both are present. Okay. PM changes. This is tachinoid. What we see in the eye, right? Like when the eyes are slightly open and in this clear a white part of the eye, the dust gets deposited and that gives the tachinoid, which means the person's eye was not completely closed, right? So that is tachinoid. It helps in determining the time since death. It helps in determining the time since death. Okay, tattoo spots are seen in asphyxia. Right? Petty case which are seen in the face and everything. Captain's line is seen in copper poisoning. Right? And Kevorkian sign is again in the retina. Okay? If you're going to see the blood vessels. Okay? If you see the blood vessels, they are going to show some trucking pattern. So what is this trucking pattern? There's going to be red blood cells deposited and then there's going to be space for Plasma, red blood cells, plasma, red blood cells, plasma, red blood cells, plasma. So that trucking pattern is called as the Kevorkian sign. Okay. So other few PM changes, though initiated in the last two years, have not asked which might come is know about hypostasis, which is the post mortem deposition of blood in the dependent part of the body. Know about marbling, right? 36 to 48 hours it appears like a marbled platen, a superficial vessel gets stained in the body. Okay. Then polypitive or liquefactive necrosis, right? The tissue all becomes liquefied and completely becomes, you know, polypitive. Okay. That liquefaction, like liquefied state happens in around five days. Okay? And it passes through these stages only. It is fresh. It gets the discoloration, it gets distended, it gets dissolved, it becomes a dry skin. Complete skeletonization happens. Okay? Okay. Next, traumatology. We have already uh, seen a part of it, but in this particular with, with this particular question, let's see blunt force trauma. Let's see the blunt force trauma. Okay. The finding given in this particular picture is it's a ligature mark, which is an abrasion. And in this ligature mark, what has happened in this particular ligature mark? The force is small, but the duration has been high. So it's a small amount of pressure for a long duration, like a shoe bite, right? Like the shoe bite is a small amount of pressure for a long duration, right? So that is a pressure abrasion. That's a pressure 
abrasion. Okay, so let's see the other abrasion just in images. Linear abrasion is the scratches. Grazed abrasion is what we see in road traffic accidents, right? Pressure abrasion is the ligature mark and imprint abrasion is what is produced by a belt, right? What is produced by a belt is called, or a belt or a, a, any other, you know, like a kick mark, okay? That is called as the imprint. Here, the force is high and the duration is small. Okay, the force is high, the duration is very small. Okay, okay. Now, among these, these two can produce a pattern. The pressure and imprint can produce a pattern, right? The pressure can produce the pattern of the rope, which is used. The imprint can produce, like, you know, the shoe sole mark or the uh, belt mark, as in this case, it can be produced. Whereas in the upper above two cases, like the scratch and the graze, they are in you know tangential direction, like the tangential direction, and they will produce skin tan. Okay, right. Scratch, the skin gets heaped to one side. Grazed, the skin gets heaped to one side. Okay. Okay. Then the other form of blunt force trauma is contusion. Delayed is when the person has got hit, but it the injury becomes visible after sometimes because the clot is in the Deep structure. Okay, it was the deep structure. Okay, raccoon eye is where the blood gets accumulated around the eyeball. Raccoon eye is where the blood gets accumulated around the eyeball. The trauma can be in the scalp. Okay, or it can be in the base of the skull, anterior cranial fossa fracture. Okay. Yes, it can be in the scalp. It can be in the anterior cranial cranial fossa, which has got fractured. Yes, or it can be due to direct trauma. But when it's in the scalp or anterior cranial fossa fracture, we call it as the ectopic bruise, which means it's a migratory bruise. It has migrated because it's a loose areolar tissue. It has migrated to the eye region. Next is the tram track bruise. Tram track bruises, which is produced by a Stick, right? A stick produces a tram track. These two lines will be seen as it's like a kind of a railway line. Okay. Battle sign is again trauma, collection of blood in the mastoid region, right? The mastoid region. Another example of ectopic use. And then you know, Cullen sign, great inner sign in you know, peritoneal, retroperitoneal bleed, you get on the lateral sign and around the umbilicus. Color and returns. Down it is when because of a ball. Same principle. Ball comes and hits. The central region goes inside. The surrounding region becomes nicely confused. That is drawn and bruise. And then six penny bruises because of person holding. The finger pads will produce a mark similar to six penny bruise. Okay. And butterfly bruises because of pinching. Pinching will produce a butterfly bruise. Love bite is because of the suction effect. Tire mark is because of the tire, but the wire of the, you know, the wire the, or the marks on the tire will produce a mark like this. Okay. Okay. Lacerations, three types only. Stretch laceration because of overstretching, avulsed laceration, heavy vehicle run over, right? Heavy vehicle run over can produce a avulsed laceration. Heavy vehicle run over can, the skin just gets ripped off, avulsed off. Okay, and scalping is where, like in the industrial region, when they are not working with a you know proper safe hair mesh, and the hair is pretty long, the hair gets pulled into a heavy machinery. Okay, so that produces a avulsed laceration, and then split laceration is a small region in the scalp uh, or like any bony prominence. It's the most important thing is the bone. Okay, any bony prominences, the tissue gets crushed between the bone and the uh, skin, and it just tears off. Okay, that's a split. It looks like an incised wound. It is an incised looking laceration. It's an incised looking laceration. Okay, the next one. A uh, dead body of a person was found in his apartment. On examination, the following injuries will present. What is the best description? 
This is not a grazed abrasion. We just saw grazed abrasion. It's on these skin products. It is more produced by a sharp weapon. Defenses, when we try to protect ourselves, right? It tends to be more deep and everything. This is a hesitation cut. Multiple small spots before the suicidal attempts, the parasuicidal attempts. Those are hesitation cut before the fatal blow. Okay. Now, pattern abrasion again we saw, right? What all produces pattern abrasion we saw? We saw that pressure and imprint produces pattern abrasion. Okay. The next one, firearm. In firearm, we saw that there's a cartridge. It has a primer. It has a gunpowder. Okay. And then finally, it has the bullet. When the gunpowder has burnt, if this gunpowder has burnt, it produces soup or smoke. Okay. If the gunpowder is not burnt, unburnt or partially burnt, then what happens? You get peppering because these gunpowders also has a mass and a velocity. They will travel, they will get deposited under the skin. So they will produce something called as the tattooing. So this tattooing or peppering, small, small dot, 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 dot things that you're seeing, it is because of unburnt or partially burnt particles. Okay? Okay. The next one, a female was brought it to the casualty with lacerated wounds. Okay, so she has one is lacerated wounds around the chest wall, small multiple abrasions over the anterior abdomen along with laceration. Okay, burn, they would have given burn. Now, these are all not suggestive of burn. Okay, shock wave, barotrauma, tympanic membrane rupture. Right, so you will get a TM rupture. Okay, fall of a building. Not small. We are not talking about small abrasions and contusions. Fall of a building will produce traumatic asphyxia or it will produce complete compression and laceration of or fracture of all the bones, right? So these are produced by something called as the flying missiles in explosion. So in explosion, let's say the glass is there and inside the glass, there is a chemical explosive and this chemical explosive blasts. All small, small pieces of these glasses will go here and there, right? That's called as a flying missile. They go and they impact on the body. And what will they produce? They will produce small, 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 small laceration on the body. And small, because these are all small, blunt, blunt force like object. They'll produce small, small, small lacerations. And they will produce small, small, small abrasions and contusions. Okay? So that's called as a martial style. All these small, small, small contusion, laceration and abrasion that you get. Okay, and seen it. Bomb blast. So they can ask us bomb blast or explosion. Okay. Okay. The next one. Region. Ring fracture. Hinge fracture. Bond fracture. So as per the name, you can see hinge means it's going to function as a hinge. Base of skull again. This is also a base of skull. But this is seen mainly in door traffic accidents. Right. Then ring fracture. You have the foramen magnum. Around the foramen magnum, you see a line of fracture. That is the ring fracture, right? Then pond fracture, pond fractures in infant. Then the forceps is applied and taken out. The parietal bone sometimes can have a small depression like this. That's called as the pond fracture. It creates a small pond, right? And this might fracture the inner table at here and the outer tables at these regions. So that's a small form fracture. So it's seen it in pan. Okay. And then gutter fracture. Gutter is you have the outer table and you have the inner table. Let me call the outer table and inner table. You have the outer table and you have an inner table. Now a bullet just passes through the center like this. So what do you get? You get a gutter fracture. It has just like created a small gutter, grazed and gone off. That's all. Okay, like here, they have caused a gutter and it's gone. Okay, so that's a gutter fracture. It's seen it 
you let me. Yes? Okay. The next one. What do you see? Pancake like? It's like a pancake. Okay. Okay. Let's see the history. History of assault, uh, they presented with sleepy, lethargy, and headache, right? Uh, there was no history of vomiting. The contrast CT show biconvex. It is showing a biconvex. In these cases, now immediately draw it so that like you will remember like okay, biconvex. Where do we get biconvex? You get biconvex in extra dural hemorrhage, right? We are clear about it. Where we have got the biconvex, we have got it in the extra dural hemorrhage. Next, what produces their question is what is the source of this hemorrhage? Middle meningeal artery. As simple as it. See, anything, the skull is in this shape and the dura is very strongly adherent to it. So when the blood the bleeding is happening, they both separate and the bleeding will collect like this. Okay. Anything below it, see any hemorrhage below the subdural hemorrhage, it will be concavo convex, subdural hemorrhage. Okay, subarachnoid, still again concave upon like going into all the gray matter and everything, I mean, like into the sulcus, right? Non gray matter into the sulcus, so that you see it subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? Okay, so if the cortical vessels and all are breaking, they predominantly produce a SAH subarachnoid hemorrhage. Bridging veins, bridging veins are cortical vessel to the sinuses, right? And they go through the subdural space. So in the subdural space, due to acceleration, deceleration, trauma, they produce rupture. They produce subdural hemorrhage. Lenticular obstruitus, intra-parenchymal hemorrhage. Into the brain cap, the parenchyma it bleeds, right? In hypertensive patient, lenticular striate will be the most common one that ruptures and it bleeds into the brain parenchyma. Okay. So here you have a proper extraneural hemorrhage, okay? And the vessel is middle meningeal artery. It is produced due to direct trauma. So direct means the bone has fractured or the, well, you know, some in direct impact has happened. So bone fractures are associated in more than 80% of cases, right? Next is subdural hemorrhage. Subdural means just below the dura. They are generally in this shape, present shape. Okay, whereas here you may get biconvex shape, right? Okay, now here they are crescent shape. So you can see the blood after removing the dura. This is the dura. This is the dura. Okay, so this is the dura which has been reflected, right? And here you can see the bleeding. Blood. Subdural, okay? The brain is visible over here. This part of the part where you can see the brain. Okay, so in the subdural hemorrhage, what happens? The blood is getting accumulated in the subdural space. It gets a crescent shape more. After sometimes you can say that this is a chronic subdural hemorrhage. Right? The vessel is a which vessel gets ruptured? We saw the bridging vessel gets ruptured. And it is a Acceleration, deceleration, trauma. Okay. Subdural, most in adolescent age group and in early adulthood is because of very aneurysm. Very aneurysm, right? In the circle of villus, anterior part, very aneurysm ruptures and it causes the bleeding. Okay. Uh, apart from very aneurysm, any kind of uh, trauma to the head. Uh, some amount of SDH is seen in any head injury that leads to death. Okay, any head injury that leads to death, some amount of SAH is generally seen. Okay, okay. Next question: Burn patient. Patient comes to OPD with sudden burn injury, right thigh. Blisters are there. Okay, splash marks are there. Of course, it is called splash means. Only two things, right? It is either hot liquid or uh, it is chemicals. That only can splash. Okay. The third is electrical, right? The electrical, but electrical you will get more of uh, only the exposed part or they will get some amount of charring. There, there also electrical spark can happen, right? Or electrical splash can happen, okay? 
Okay, there's, there's a clear line of demarcation between the burnt and the unburnt area. This is a case of carl injury, which is nothing but a moist burn. Okay, it's nothing but a moist burn. Okay. Next, uh, they have given the different forms of torture and they have asked which of the method is not correctly matched. N-O-T, not correctly matched. Okay, okay. Uh, let's go from the lower part. Destinado, beating a person is sold, right? It is the sold. Okay. The other name for Bestinado is Palanga. Okay. The other name for Bestinado is Palanga. Okay. Okay. Parrot preaches. We remember parrot uh, preach with uh, Jack Sparrow in uh, Pirates of Caribbean. The way, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Depp is carried. That is Parrot preach. They are literally carried on a rod, like limbs tied together over here. Okay. So that is parrot preach. Okay. Okay, next. Uh, chepua means legs and lives are tied together with a bamboo stick. Very tightly. Okay, the legs and thigh are very tightly tied together with a bamboo stick. Okay, so Palanga, insertion of lati or uh, any object into the anal canal is actually sodomy. Okay, if they use any rod which is containing chili powder in the end and then insert it into the anal canal. Okay. That is called as Hyderabad Goli. Okay. And they can also apply electricity on the top and insert it. Cattle prod. Like the cattle prod is the actually the stick which is used to keep the tail of the cattle to keep going in the line and everything. So they can use for torture. These are all methods of torture. Okay. Okay. Next. They have asked what is whether this injury is grievous or not. So we will revise what is a grievous injury and let's look into the question. A 30-year-old male presented to the casualty with injury to the left eye, corneal obesity has come. Okay. Corrected with corneoplasty. So the court takes the natural course. Okay. And even if corneoplasty is done, it does